Greetings and welcome to the MOOC Introduction to Biorisk Management. In this lecture, we will focus on Personal Protective Equipment or PPEs. This is an example of PPEs as they are deployed in the field. These field workers are equipped with PPEs which offer protection against different kinds of biological agents. This laboratory worker is wearing a complete set of PPEs. He has been equipped with respiratory protection, ocular protection, cutaneous protection in the form of his biosafety suit as well as gloves and footwear. Now this worker on the other hand has exposed surfaces of his skin and this can constitute a potential breach of containment. Now PPEs as used by field workers represent a last line of defense against biological agents. These are the learning objectives for this particular lecture. In this lecture, you will learn about the different types of PPEs, learn how to select PPEs based on risk assessment, learn about the standard operating procedures associated with PPEs, and learn about specialized PPEs. The learning outcomes for this lecture are as follows. Upon completion of this module, you should demonstrate the ability to describe the various types of PPEs, select PPEs to mitigate the risk posed by biological agents, understand how administrative controls must be used concurrently with PPEs. There are various types of PPEs. These include masks or respirators, gloves, protective suits, protective eyewear and specialized PPEs. Masks or respirators are designed to protect you against biological agents that are transmitted via aerosols. In this case, the route of entry of the biological agent into the host is via the airway. A wide range of masks are currently available and the N95 respirator is one of the most widely used masks in the current situation. Another aspect which must be explained and explored is the fit testing of masks. Reuse of masks is not recommended as masks can be compromised when they are sterilized using disinfectants. There are standards for masks and you may refer to this particular standard from the European Committee for Standardization in order to obtain an insight into the standards for masks. The N95 respirator is available in different models, the 8210, the 1860 and the 1870 plus. This is an example of the 1860S, which protects you against particulates and can also be used as a surgical mask. The 3M model 8210 is designed to protect the wearer from exposure to airborne particles which include dust, mist, fumes, fibers and bioaerosols such as viruses and bacteria. Please take note that this particular respirator can also be used to protect the user against non-biological agents such as dust and other particles which are airborne. N95s are designed to fit tightly on the face and create a seal between the user's face and the respirator. They meet certain requirements of the NEOSH 42 CFR 84 and the N95 respirator will filter out a minimum of 95% of the solids and liquid aerosols that do not contain oil. One should take into account the fact that the N95 respirator has not been designed 
to protect the laboratory worker against aerosols that are borne on an oil or an oil particulate. The N95 8210 cannot be used as a surgical mask and it is not resistant to fluids. This is an example of a fit test. Now a fit test is a requirement when you select a respirator for your particular facial type or your face profile. Now the lady in this picture is wearing a respirator which has been designed for her facial profile. Now before she actually commences work in the lab, this respirator must be fit tested and this fit testing is achieved by wearing this specific gear over the, the face and the biosafety officer which is this gentleman is using a nebulizer to create an aerosol in this particular space. Now this nebulizer may contain a agent which has a particular order and a particular taste and if the mask is effective this user should not be able to detect the order or the taste of this particular aerosol and fit testing is an essential procedure which must be conducted prior to selecting a mask to suit your particular facial profile. Gloves are available in many forms. We have the latex gloves, nitrile gloves as well as reinforced gloves. Now latex gloves are not recommended for usage with chemicals as they are permeable to many of the organic solvents. Nitrile gloves on the other hand are impermeable to solvents but must be used in accordance with their limitations. Double gloving is another procedure which is recommended for operations involving biological agents. This is to mitigate any effect from spills. Reinforced gloves are recommended when working with animals such as mice in the laboratory setting as animals tend to scratch and cause injuries to the skin. Protective suits are designed to protect the user from exposure to biological agents. They can be worn both in the laboratory and in the field. They will protect you against minor splashes but cannot be used to mitigate major spills. They involve a high cost and they are one time use which means that they cannot be recycled after usage. Protective eyewear such as shields which are face shields are designed to protect the entry of the biological agent via the ocular route. They will protect you against minor splashes. However, if you are working with aerosols, it is recommended that you use a powered air purifying respirator and not a face shield. Powered air purifying respirators are designed to protect the laboratory user from aerosols that can be generated in the laboratory. Let us look at the basic setup. In this case, the upper portion of this respirator comprises the helmet and if you look through the helmet which is transparent you will see the filter. This is the N95 filter. The air is directed over this filter through it and into this space over the user's face. Now the airflow generates a positive pressure in this region and the air exits through this apron and this creates a curtain of air around the user. Now this curtain of air prevents the ingestion of aerosols via this particular route. So there is always a positive pressure of air which keeps the pathogens or the biological agents out of the user's facial area. And this kind of powered air purifying respirator can protect you against aerosols as well as splashes during routine laboratory operations. A video on the 
usage of the respirator can be accessed from this particular link. I have prepared a link for you with a tutorial on the usage of the PAPR. Pressurized suits are generally used in a BSL-4 laboratory and this pressurized suit is supplied with pressurized air via a tube. The suit is maintained as a positive pressure environment. In the case of a breach of containment, for instance, a tear in the suit or a needle stick injury, the air will basically exit through the suit and prevent the intake of any kind of biological agent. Pressurized suits are extremely expensive and their usage is limited to BSL-4 and other high containment facilities. We now move on to the selection of the PPEs. Of the PPEs is based on the risk assessment. Now, in the risk assessment, we must consider the biological agent itself and the risk group to which it belongs. Now, I have indicated another risk group here, which is novel. So, in case the risk group is unknown or novel, we must utilize the highest level of protection, which involves the pressurized suit. The various risk groups and their PPEs associated with them are listed in this particular table. So we have respirators for risk group 1 and 2. However, in the case of the higher risk groups, it is recommended that a biosafety suit and a PAPR be utilized in conjunction with each other. We must also take into account the portal of entry when selecting the PPE. So in this case, we must select the PPE based on the route of entry or the portal of entry of the biological agent. I have given you this table and you can study it in order to determine the selection of the PPE based on the portal of the entry. PPEs must also take into account laboratory procedures. For instance, a simple laboratory procedure such as receiving a sample may require donning or wearing of gloves, a respirator and a biosafety suit. However, when you process the sample using pipettes, which can generate an aerosol, we must use additional protection such as a PAPR. Certain procedures such as nucleic acid extraction or DNA and RNA extraction may also require usage of PAPR as the process of centrifugation and extraction can lead to the production of aerosols. Another challenge faced by laboratory workers is working with animals. Small animals tend to bite and scratch and this can lead to cutaneous wounds and biological agents can enter through these cuts and scratches in the skin. When we conduct a risk assessment for animals, we must look at these factors, the size of the animal, the behavior of the animal, the reservoir for potential human pathogens or zoonotic agents, the field work or laboratory work, and the portal of entry of the biological agent carried by the animals. Working with large animals may involve the selection and usage of specific PPEs. PPEs must be used in conjunction with administrative controls. The selection of PPEs must be done after thorough risk assessment. This in itself is an administrative control. The choice of PPEs depends on the risk group and the laboratory procedure, which is another administrative control. Laboratory users must be trained to don and doff PPEs in compliance with SOPs. Donning refers to wearing of a PPE and doffing refers to removal of a PPE. All incidents and accidents involving PPEs must be documented and reported during the audit. This includes tearing of the PPE during usage as well as the expiry date. 
Now, PPEs have an expiry date and a PPE should not be used after the expiry date. PPEs must be disposed in accordance with standard operating procedures for waste handling. This may involve the usage of autoclaves as well as incineration. To summarize, the selection of PPEs is based on risk assessment. We first look at the risk group. The next aspect which we look at is the portal of entry. And finally, we look at the laboratory procedures. Please note that all PPEs must be utilized in accordance with the standard operating procedures. That brings us to the end of this lecture on PPEs. Thank you very much for watching and I wish you a pleasant learning experience. Thank you.